from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I'm Carla Gonzalez, and this is From the South. Another 90 Venezuelan citizens have made their way back home as part of the return to the homeland planned. They returned from Argentina, having to travel through Uruguay after the Argentinian government rejected permits that would allow them to fly from there. Our correspondent in Venezuela, Luis Tavera, has the details. The Argentine government keeps positioning itself against international law. Recently, it denied the permits necessary to allow the return to the homeland plan from fulfilling its purpose. The plan aims to help Venezuelans who want to get back home for a range of reasons, including experiencing xenophobia as well as labor abuses. More than 13,000 people have benefited from the program. The Argentine government, led by Mauricio Macri, has also recognized non-authorized Venezuelan envoys who are not subject to international law law. The return to the homeland plan has not only been attacked by the Argentine government, but also by other governments, such as that of Colombia, which has tried to close aerial routes so that flights cannot operate. Thousands of Venezuelans have asked the Bolivarian government for help returning due to the reality they face in other countries, where they do not enjoy the same social protection they would in their home country. The plan allows Venezuelan citizens to return by plane or by land. The latest group of more than 90 people arrived in Venezuela by road. The plan continues and more people will be returning in the coming days. Also correspondent Luis Tavera from Caracas. And senior diplomats and former military commanders from the United States and Colombia met privately with members of the Venezuelan opposition to discuss the possibilities of a military intervention. This was revealed by journalist Max Blumenthal, editor of The Grey Zone, during an exclusive talk with Telesur. And in the meeting was essentially a grotesque gallery of coup advisors, a who's who of the personnel making the sausage of Trump's Venezuela policy. Um, that's everyone from former uh, National Security Council officials to current National Intelligence Council officials to a State Department official to the former head of U.S. Southcom, Admiral Kurt Tidd, and General Juan Pablo Amayo, who is a Colombian general working out of the Colombian embassy, as well as Juan Guaido's gang in Washington, headed up by Carlos Vecchio, and David Smolansky, who is now working under Luis Almagro at the OAS overseeing Venezuelan uh, migrant policy. So basically, a who's who of people behind the coup were involved in this uh, meeting, which was intended to be kept secret. This meeting was held for a reason, that the Trump administration and those who are shaping its policy on Venezuela are still seriously considering military options. And you can safely assume that the Trump administration is growing desperate after having failed to dislodge Maduro, as Juan Guaido assured them they would do, after the Venezuelan military has demonstrated total loyalty to the Constitution, after Guaido on his so-called Operation Freedom Tour is failing to mobilize the crowds that the U.S. had hoped he would, um, after sanctions and a blackout have failed to destabilize Venezuela's government. The only thing left is some kind of intervention. And I noticed the participation of officials from the U.S. Agency for International Development in this. And it led me to believe that if there is a military option being explored, it will be conducted under humanitarian guise. The foreign minister of Venezuela, Jorge Arreaza, has condemned new unilateral sanctions imposed on Venezuela by Canada. On Twitter, Arreaza said the government of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela categorically rejects the illegal application of new unilateral coercive measures that the government of Canada has adopted arbitrarily against high officials of the Venezuelan state. Canada has been participating in the so-called Lima Group meetings and is trying to increase its presence in Latin America. And the Cuban president has strongly rejected the Lima Group's stance on Venezuela. Via social media, Miguel Díaz-Canel said that the group is under U.S. influence and rejected its attacks against the Venezuelan government. The president also said that Cuba will answer with dignity to the group's attacks. The U.S. Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, visited the Colombia-Venezuela border over the weekend as social movements and the Bolivarian militias gathered there to reject his presence. 
Syrian militias gathered in the three border bridges of Urania, Tienditas, and Simon Bolivar to defend their country, as they did on February 23rd when the opposition and their international allies tried to force alleged humanitarian aid into the country. We had said that there was no food or medicine in those trucks. Instead, there was war equipment. Everyone saw what happened. Who is going to take responsibility? Donald Trump? Do you think someone can do that to another country? Does the U.S. want that to happen at their border? The U.S. is attacking people who want to cross their border. They want to build a wall to keep people out. But they want us to open our border so that they can come in. They think that we are their backyard. Everything was normal at the Simon Bolivar Bridge before U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo arrived. While they wanted to transform the bridge into a symbol of an alleged humanitarian crisis, the reality is that there is simply economic migration. It's usual to see people crossing into Colombia in the morning and then returning to Venezuela at night. When Pompeo arrived at the border bridge, he said that President Nicolas Maduro should have opened the border to allow the entrance of the so-called humanitarian aid. But Venezuelan authorities report that his visit is part of an electoral strategy for the 2020 elections in the United States. There are upcoming elections in the U.S. and in Colombia, so they are going around all Latin America using Venezuela as a strategy for their political gain. While Pompeo was in Cucuta, in the other side of the bridge, Venezuelan people protested his presence. We have always respected our governments, and we respect the U.S. government. But we ask to get the same respect because international law protects the self-determination of people. We don't agree with the U.S. system, but we respect it. And what we ask from the world is that they respect our socialist system. Recently, journalist Max Blumenthal revealed that on the 10th of April, a group of U.S., Colombian and Brazilian officials who coordinate U.S. propaganda in the region met to discuss war against Venezuela. The Venezuelan vice president, Delcy Rodriguez, also reported that a plan is being prepared to start a military intervention in the country, a plan backed by the U.S. and that could become a crime against humanity. The spokesperson for China's foreign ministry has once again called out U.S. officials for their slanderous comments regarding Latin America-China relations. During a news conference on Monday, Liu Kang said Latin American countries will come to the right conclusion about who their true allies are. Facts have proved that China has brought opportunities to Latin American countries. We also noted some of the false accusations from the U.S. Secretary of State Pompeo in Venezuela against China. I won't mention that China's position on the Venezuelan issue is clear and consistent. We stand firmly for the orders and principles of the UN Charter to maintain regional peace and stability. For a long time, the United States has regarded Latin America as its own backyard and pressured, threatened and even toppled other countries' political regimes. Justice is in people's heart, who is a true friend, who is a fake friend, who ignores the rules and spreads chaos. We believe Latin American countries will make a right decision. On Monday, Brazil said it will quit the Union of South American Nations, UNASUR. The announcement came just hours after it received the pro-temporary presidency of the organization. The presidency will now pass to Chile, a country that leads attempts at dismantling the bloc and creating a new one, PROSUR, made up by right-wing governments in the region. Our correspondent in Sao Paulo has more on this decision. On the morning of April 16th, far-right Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro announced that Brazil will be pulling out of UNASUR. UNASUR is the coalition of 12 South American states that was created in 2008 by Hugo Chavez and Luis Inácio Lula da Silva to establish a kind of counter-hegemonic force to U.S. imperialism in the region. It manifests in the Monroe Doctrine, which causes Americans to believe that they have the right to intervene in any country in Latin America, as we can see now with what's going on in Venezuela. So why would Brazil pull out of this? Why would the president, who promised that he would place the interests of Brazil above all others during his campaign, pull out of such an important space? Well, according to former foreign affairs minister and defense minister Celso Amorim, this move by the Bolsonaro government is just one more sign of 
total submission to U.S. interests in the region. Brazil is no longer acting as an independent state with self-determination and sovereignty. It's now a proxy state of the United States government, and we can see this in its relationship with Venezuela. That was Brian Miro from Brazil. Now we go to Ecuador. Former Foreign Minister Ricardo Patiño is calling for a national mobilization against the recent decisions by the government of Lenin Moreno. He called on the Ecuadorian people to demonstrate against Julian Assange's arrest, against political persecution and austerity policies. It's being called the March of National Indignation. Political and social movements will gather in the capital, Quito, and head towards the presidential palace. The FARC political party in Colombia is demanding an investigation into the death of a seven-month-old baby after an attack was carried out on the child's father. Over the weekend, the former FARC combatant was ambushed and his wife was injured as well. The reincorporation agency for the former combatants of the armed conflict says 46% of the murder cases involving ex-members have been solved. Meanwhile, 51 people have been arrested in connection with the crimes. The authorities are currently investigating the murder of 128 former combatants. The most recent attack on a former combatant occurred in the department of Huahira over the weekend. While the man remains hospitalized in a critical condition, his seven-month-old child has died. We hadn't previously received threats in Guaira, unlike other departments like the Valle del Cauca. This shows that paramilitaries are active all across the country. In the same way, we must also be active all across Colombia, and we need to find out who was behind this vile attack. The UN Security Council recently drew attention to the Colombian government's continued failure to provide guarantees for former combatants. The visibility of police and air force in many areas is crucial, as violent competition between armed groups near security forces is putting many in grave danger and endangering peace across Colombia. According to experts, 76 percent of former FARC combatants remain hopeful that they can be reintegrated in society, but they demand guarantees from the government to safeguard their lives and well-being. We'll take a short break now. Don't go away. The Caribbean Court of Justice says it is well equipped to dispense justice in the region. And to speak on its behalf, the 14-year-old tribunal called on a senator, a lecturer and a lineup of respected jurists from a, for a media open day to be broadcasted live on Sunday. Barbados, Guyana, Belize and Dominica have already signed up to the CCJ jurisdiction. A Trinidadian national has been shortlisted to win the world's richest poetry prize. Dion Brand has been nominated for The Blue Clerk, an original work about the art of writing. The former Port Laureate is up against six other nominees for the $75,000 Griffin Poetry Jackpot. Brand has previously won the Governor General's Award and the 2011 Griffin Poetry Prize. Some say that poets should stay on matters of nature on matters of love, on the domestic, on language, the esoteric, not history, not politics, 
I've often been asked what literature has to do with justice, with freedom, with liberation. This is the conservative line of poetry. To stay away from politics, stay away from intervening in the everyday, except to soothe, to bring good tidings, observe beauty. Barbadians will now have to wait even longer to use drones. That's because the temporary suspension on the importation and licensing of the remotely piloted aircraft has been extended for another 12 months. The ban had been in place since March 2016. The government is now working on new legislation to regulate the use of drones and to integrate them into the national airspace system. Officials in Kenya have evacuated doctors working in countries near the border with Somalia after recent abductions. Last week, two Cuban doctors were kidnapped and their security guard killed by gunmen believed to belong to the Somalia-based Al-Shabaab group. The group has conducted frequent assaults in Mandera, which borders Somalia, aiming to put pressure on the Kenyan government to withdraw its troops from Somalia. The African Union has given the military in Sudan a 15-day ultimatum to transfer power to a civilian-led authority or face suspension from the bloc. Our correspondent in Pretoria, Matuba Malaji, has more. The number of African states that are affiliated with the African Union might go down to 54 if the military council in Sudan does not respond to the African Union's call to hand over power to civilians. Now, the, the, the military council took over power last week when uh, Omar al-Bashir eventually gave up power after massive protests around the country calling for him to step down. Now, Others are calling the, the, the military councils overseeing the country as a coup because that's, what, that's not what the people of Sudan had in, envisaged after Omar al-Bashir left power. Even the African Union has said that the military council being in power at this point does not reflect the aspirations of the people of Sudan. Hence, it has given the military council 15 days to hand over power to to, to, to the civilians or face suspension, suspension from the 55 member state uh, body. The, that's, the African, that's the African Union. That was Matuba Madlaji from Pretoria. And the Libyan deputy minister has claimed that Khalifa Haftar is attempting to stage a coup through military confrontation. Ahmed Maiteg has called for the withdrawal of Haftar's troops from the outskirts of the capital Tripoli and the western region. The Libyan National Army advanced to the outskirts of Tripoli weeks ago, which has seen clashes with the army of the Government of National Accord. At least 174 people have been killed. 14 of them were civilians. There is a troop invasion of Tripoli from uh, Haftar and his uh, military. Uh, they were starting uh, to attack the capital of Libya. Tripoli and the government of National Accord, the legitimate government of Libya. Uh, this has uh, happened around 13 years, days ago. Uh, today, uh, the position of the government is very clear. Uh, this is a coup, and uh, he has to go back with his troop to where he was before this all happening. The chief of the United Nations Refugee Agency says the escalation of the conflict in Libya makes it hard for them to operate in the territory. During a press conference with the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, Filippo Grandi said the worsening of the conflict in Libya could create further displacements. In light of the security situation in Libya's capital, Tripoli, Grandi made an urgent call for the immediate release of refugees and migrants in detention. Many of them are imprisoned in areas where there is ongoing fighting. We are particularly concerned, like you are, Chancellor, by the situation in Libya. Of course, from our perspective, Libya is uh, uh, a country of transit of thousands of refugees and migrants, many of whom try to come to Europe. In the last uh, few months, we managed to have access to some of the detention center and uh, alleviate the plight of some of the people. This uh, particular uh, escalation of the conflict makes it very difficult to do that work and uh, could 
create even further displacement as we saw in 2011. At least 4,000 people in the Democratic Republic of Congo have been affected by the chikungunya dengue epidemic in the southern part of the country. Health officials are calling on the population to take preventive measures, including the use of mosquito nets. The first cases of this epidemic were detected in January in the coastal city of Pointe Noire by the Institute of Biomedical Research in Kinshasa. Chikungunya is a mosquito-borne viral disease that is transmitted from human to human by the bites of infected female mosquitoes. An outbreak of measles has killed more than 1,200 people in Madagascar. The country is facing the largest outbreak in its history, with the number of recorded cases growing beyond 115,000. According to the World Health Organization, only 58% of people have been vaccinated. The outbreak has mostly killed children under 15 years since beginning in September. The president of Equatorial Guinea, Obiang Ngema, said his country is going to abolish the, the death sentence. The last time the country applied the death sentence was in 2014, but the president has suggested that the judicial measure will soon be abolished. The decision follows pressure by the community of Portuguese language countries, of which Equatorial Guinea is a member and that is opposed to the capital punishment. The president said he is going to make sure that abolition is addressed democratically. More stories coming up, we'll be back. We are present at every event of what our nations are staring. We believe in a new global vision, united in every broadcasting. We keep expanding our horizons and working on a closer and better communication. Now, in Grenada, Telesur, the new source from South America and the Caribbean. Thank you for joining us again. Indonesians are preparing for elections that are going to take place on Wednesday. Over 190 million registered voters will cast their votes. The Election Commission is currently battling torrential downpours, voter fraud allegations and cyber attacks. Ballot papers have been distributed to most parts of the country, including rural areas. Meanwhile, Indonesia's election board has recommended a re-vote for citizens who voted last week in Malaysia and Australia. In Kuala Lumpur, for example, thousands of ballot papers endorsing President Joko Widodo were found in a warehouse on the outskirts of the city. Ballots allegedly not cast by eligible voters were found in several places in Kajang, Bandar, Paru, Bangi, Selanga State, Malaysia. Some of the votes that were counted by the Overseas Election Committee are thought not to have been done in secret and therefore are not in accordance to the principles of free and fair elections. Therefore, the Overseas Election Committee in Kuala Lumpur did not carry out its responsibility objectively, transparently and professionally in election 2019. South Korea's Constitutional Court ordered the country's decades-old abortion ban to be lifted in a landmark ruling last week. The government lifted the ban after years of campaigning against it, which puts women at risk and includes prison sentences for doctors practicing abortions. Activists celebrated following the decision, which was made by a judge in the city of Seoul. Today, we were able to confirm that the abortion ban is unconstitutional in regards to women's rights. I hope the National Assembly will respect the Constitutional Court's ruling and make the best law possible that respects women's rights. The Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Yavad Sarif visited the capital of Syria to hold strategic discussions. While in Damascus, he will meet with Syrian government officials. 
Among the issues to be discussed are bilateral relations, regional and international concerns, as well as the fight against terrorism. They will also discuss the threats posed by the United States to their respective governments. French citizens woke up to the smoldering ruins of the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. It took more than 400 firefighters to contain Monday's place. The fire destroyed the roof of the 850-year-old landmark, including its delicate spire, which collapsed. But the cathedral's two iconic front towers were saved. Authorities say the fire was caused by an accident during restoration work. They say the investigation does not point towards arson. Spain is in the middle of an electoral campaign. On one side, Madrid-based parties call for the unity of the kingdom. But for the region of Catalonia, the strategy is completely different. At least two million Catalans hope for an independent state, and political groups are seeking to channel wider support. Unionist socialism or left-wing independence, PSC or Esquerra Republicana, these two parties have the best chance of winning the general election in Catalonia, and a big part of the electorate is split. Esquerra hopes to exploit PSC's undecided voters, saying that without them, Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez won't be under enough pressure to sit and talk about the aspirations of Catalonia. They say it is important to remember that PSOE has given ground to the extreme right following its recent resurgence in Spain. Do not vote for parties that have failed to fight against the extreme right. Do not vote for PSOE. Doing so only helps the extreme right. Don't vote for PSOE. They have incapacitated the Spanish state. But the PSC, the Catalan arm of the PSOE Federation, intends to capture undecided Esquerra voters, claiming to be the only force capable of stopping the extreme right. There is a real danger from the right wing, and there is a real risk of the reversal of devolution. What I want to say is that we cannot trust anyone. For now, Esquerra Republicana hasn't made any conditions regarding support for Pedro Sanchez and helping Pessoy form a government in Madrid. Its political strategy is to keep all options open. But former President Carles Puigdemont, now exiled in Belgium, does consider that the judicial repression of the independence process has to be stopped and that the right to Catalonia's self-determination must be respected. The indispensable condition to come to the table is our validation, so we can talk. We are asking for recognition. The question is simple. What are the conditions in which we'll conduct our politics, those of October 1st? With the campaign underway, five of the nine political prisoners on trial at the Spanish Supreme Court are unable to participate in rallies or debates. The independence movement regrets that because of this situation, they are forced to contend with more difficult conditions with respect to other candidates. And with that, we end our news brief, but you can read more on these stories by going to our website, telesurenglish.net. For our viewers in Africa, you can find us on Starsat Channel 461 in South Africa and Channel 539 in Nigeria. And you can also join us on social media. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.